even with wind, like a kind of an, a, a non-experienced sound designer might just put in a, but that gives you no character. Like what I'm looking for is like a, like character in your wind. Oh yeah. Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley. And today on the show, we have Dallas Taylor, which I think the best way to describe Dallas is just he's a master of cinematic sound. That's how I like to refer to him anyway. He also owns De Facto Sound, which is just an incredible company that works on all kinds of amazing projects, like things for HBO, Nat Geo, AMC, and Netflix. And some of the stuff I geek out about the most is his work for Game of Thrones. They do the last time ons and trailers and just amazing work. They've also done work on trailers for Fallout, Elder Scrolls, and a lot more. And he has a great podcast of his own called 20,000 Hertz, which is one you should definitely check out. It's a different sort of podcast, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but it's fantastic. Definitely check that out. But of course, you can jump over to filmriot.com forward slash podcast, find the episode page for this episode, and get links to all his other work. But now I'm going to shut up and get into it with Dallas. So just to get the usual start of things, how did you get into this to begin with? Sure. So I, um, I was a trumpet player a while back ago. That was the only thing I was really good at in high school. And somehow I, I was not great at anything else, but somehow the trumpet was that thing. And then um, went to music school about halfway through music school, started to struggle with some performance anxiety, just having some problems with just like shaking and stuff in recitals. And oh, like interesting. That. Yes. Did, did that never happen to you in uh, high school? No, not at all. For some reason. That's very um, interesting. I was in all the like first year and like all of the region stuff and kind of all the state stuff and then went into uh, college and immediately even as a freshman was like first year in the wind symphony and all these things and it really took like two and a half years and then suddenly like a performance anxiety kind of hit me like a freight train that's interesting i can totally relate to that because something similar happened i used to do like on stage performance and stuff without problem Mm -hmm. and now i get crazy stage fright if it's any kind of a performance thing i don't want to be in front of the camera so i have also like evolved this weird performance anxiety which you wouldn't expect i wonder what that comes from maybe it's just like the understanding of what you're doing and what what's at stake maybe Yeah. What's interesting about that is like, I've been told in the past that if you're the person who faints while playing, like no one will forget you. Or, or if you are giving this big talk and you faint, like you'll be the one thing that people actually remember. So it could be a good thing, (laughs) (laughs) but okay. It's strategy. I like it. But I think the root of my personal problems with it, and this was, this is said a lot in like classical music and stuff is that, you know, your best performance will always be in a practice room and you want to try to get as close to that as possible when you're actually um, performing. And I don't want the things that I do at the top of my level to be stuck by myself in a practice room. I, I want to practice. And of course, even what I do now, like I practice and practice and tweak and figure things out. But when I perform something or make something, I want it to stick and stay permanently. And I think that's kind of what the root of the issue was back when I was getting that degree is I really just wanted to like make stuff that didn't just get stuck. I also wanted to make stuff that was original too. Uh, whereas yeah. classical music and stuff, you're really just like performing a lot of really incredible pieces, but it, but it is a, a little bit of a remembrance type of world over kind of like sometimes depending on where you are. I mean, if you're in LA and you're doing sessions and stuff, like it's a different can of worms, but sure. But yeah, so I kind of went through school, had some performance anxiety, but at the same time I was really messing around with like computers and MIDI and making sounds and making music for like marching bands and stuff. And then one thing led to another and I just decided to try this little like recording school. I think it was like a summer program. It was maybe like six weeks and it was after my bachelor's went there and I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I was fascinated with it, but immediately realized I did not want to record music. I didn't love that world of kind of being the coolest person in the room. Right. I'm much more of like a, I want to hang with like a NASA scientist and, you know, get nerdy about stuff. And post audio kind of started to present itself. And then I worked my way in just by like pointing a camera at a news person and then moved out to LA and then started pointing cameras at news people until I got to get in front of the audio board. And then, uh, then started actually doing like news and live shows and sports and all these things. And um, one thing led to another. I knew that, again, that was the performance aspect because it was all live. I knew I wanted to get into post and sound design. So eventually kind of worked my way toward that and worked at G4, which is an amazing old video game network that was ahead of its yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. What, what'd you work on at G4? <laughs> oh my God, everything. I mean, everything from like Attack of the Show through um, X-Play, through mixing their full shows and promos and 
sound designing spots and all kinds of stuff. So like when G4 was in its heyday, I was there yeah. working, like touching almost everything. And uh, it was so That's great. That's amazing. I remember there was one in the early days of Film Riot, G4 featured like something from one of our, our episodes and we were like, what? <laughs> Olivia Munn knows we exist. <laughs> I, I didn't realize at the time how magical it was. I mean, it was a sweatshop though. Like it was a sweatshop. Oh, really? Because for some reason, just the games and things like that, it just, you know, didn't have the mass appeal on cable television. Right. But it did. That is where I kind of like fell in love with sound design because every day I was hearing game sound design and just everyone that I worked with was just really pushing all the producers, all the writers, like everybody was just like, you know, they were living in the year 3000 with like what they were doing with with sound and, and knew the importance of it. So that job kind of like made me fall in love with sound design. But one thing led to another, a senior sound designer mixer position on the East Coast opened up at the Discovery Channel. So that, especially back when I was considering that, like mid 2000s, it was Discovery Channel. It was like classic Discovery Channel, like Planet Earth, yeah. Bear Grylls, like Dirty Jobs, Discovery Channel. It was amazing. Right. Another heyday. Uh, yeah. Oh my, it was amazing. So took that job, worked there for a little while, loved it, but just started to, you know, that little G4. Was that, was that all post? It was all post. Post sound there too? Yeah. So it was all so like- So you, you worked on uh, Dirty Jobs and Bear Grylls and all that? Yeah. We would do a lot of different things. So, you know, not only would it be like mixed domestically, but there's like different mixes around the world with different narrators and different different cuts. Oh yeah. So I was doing a lot of that, a lot of promos. Is there a lot of like Foley and whatnot in, in shows like that? Uh, not as much in those. And it kind of depends on which part of the process we were working on because right. a lot of these shows have like, there might be an original production company that then does an original mix, but then it might come internal and it gets recut and rebuilt for other markets. Oh, gotcha. Uh, but then there would be a lot of original things that would come through that we would, um, like Discovery would be the production company and we'd work on that. But internally, just naturally, it's an amazing job. It was an amazing place. I still have a lot of friends there. We'd work on promos for, you know, Deadliest Catch and all this great stuff. But the nature of being internal at a corporation is that you are kind of like the janitors in a way. Not saying that anybody is, you know, not incredibly talented. It's that when it can't be done anywhere, like someone at the end of the line has to finish something. Yeah. And so what you find is like a lot of big bulk block booking on some things that they don't necessarily want to pay to go out of house with. And so while I was there, I saw all these amazing things being made externally. And that's really kind of like what gave me the bug to, well, maybe I want to go out and do this independently. And I was also wanting to really work with National Geographic and, you know, HBO and like all these other entities, commercials and games and all that. So eventually decided I'll slide over and try to make my own company. And thank goodness I did not know what that entailed then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate. I can relate to it being the janitor as well, because I worked for a company called Alienware, which was ended up being the gaming division of Dell. Dell bought them while I was there. But they would go externally for things that we had the capabilities to do mm -hmm. in-house which we could have done for like half the cost because it was in-house, but they would just keep going to external production companies. And that that's what really got me fed up and be like, all right, I got to get out of here because they're just not bringing anything in-house except for like the most boring mundane things. Exactly. And we have the capability. So why do we have this big production studio if we're not even going to use it? Yeah. I just loved that excitement. And, and so like everything I geared the company toward that I was hoping to make was just geared toward like an experience, excitement. You know, when people go out of house, there's definitely like a... Um, excitement of working with new people. But then, you know, there are negative things about in-house as well. Because when you're in-house, like you have way more job security. If you're an external vendor, you live and die by every single thing you do. And it's exhausting and it's terrifying. Yeah. But when you're internal, you kind of have a little bit more leeway. Like no one's really going to like fire you because they need you. So you don't really have to go sure. nuts. But yeah, externally being a vendor now, it's just like everything is so intense and like just expected to be at just like an ultra high level. Yeah. And um, even in my life, I love it. Like I love that thrill. I love working with new people. I love like, you know, navigating humans and creativity and things like that. Whereas internally, like things could just get boring. It's an amazing job, amazing stuff. Even amazing projects would come through. But it was a little bit more of like I knew I was going to be here you know, at this time and leave it this time and like I could trade it off with somebody but now it's just like 
I don't know. I just like twenty four seven. You just it's twenty four seven. I have a really good work life balance that's kind of been crafted. It took me ten years to get there, dude. Me too. And it's yeah. ten years. I finally feel like I'm I'm sort of figuring out that balance a little bit. And it's yeah. been exactly ten years. Exactly. And like I have children now, and um, this whole industry is kind of like pervasive with like divorces and things like that. And it's just due to yeah. so many external sources and stress, and especially on production side, uh, which I don't envy that side. It's just you have to work really hard in this world people have it hard already just going to like a you know nine to five job but uh throw in you know travel and stress and like am i going to get a job (laughs) this week yeah especially when you own the company because there is no off button there is no clock out exactly so for me like the company for like five years solid was like just unhealthy amounts of stress i would still do it i was at the right time in my life to do it yeah but i'm really thankful that now we have a team of people who can kind of like absorb stress on multiple levels and we all really support each other with that stuff so if someone's someone's kind of burned out like someone else can kind of take the lead and run with it yeah yeah that's that's great man so so once you started de facto was, was it the connections that you had before that really started getting you your first projects to really kickstart your company or yeah. how did you go about landing those first clients i was doing double duty so i worked uh, at discovery and then like on the side i was mixing shows and uh, just had like a couple of people that would send me work outside of uh, working at discovery and um one thing i always joked with my wife like okay if we could even like get close to matching the discovery salary externally then i think that's a good uh, time to try to start the company and she agreed but then when the reality of that happens and you might be doing really well externally the reality is is when you do drop that other job you now have half or less of the salary that you have now gotten used to yeah so it's still hard because of this giant Mm -hmm. loss because now like half of your income's gone and now you have to put all of your eggs in the single basket so yeah, that, like starting it was terrifying. It definitely felt like just jumping into the deep end without anything to grab onto. Yeah, man. And it just went on for a long time. And it was through like the people who would send me work were the people who like I just knew. And then when I went independent, like they, you know, some people knew, oh, okay, there's some availability here. But it still was really hard. It wasn't like a big giant influx of work. Uh, My first year, I made not very much at all with all these startup expenses and gear and rent and all that stuff. And it it really took like a while to like start to break back even. But again, it was like it was at a time in my life where it was okay. At the time, I didn't have any kids and I was 29 when I started the company. So it was like this like perfect little thing. I could bounce around and move around and travel a lot, which I still travel a good bit. But yeah, it was just the right time to do it, the right time for that stress. But, uh, you know, hired people. Some people didn't work out. Some people did and just kind of went through this craziness. But the big thing for me was just travel, meeting people, talking to people. My entire like strategy, if you will, of building the company was just to make friends. Kind of the worst case scenario is you just have friends. Yeah. Best case scenario is you're working with people that you like. And that's still the same strategy now. Like, luckily, we've kind of pushed beyond having to say kind of yes to everything, which for, you know, five, six, seven years, it was like, if someone asks, it's always a yes. And still now it's like 98%. But now it's like, if we get kind of a bad seed or like somebody that just is real toxic, we don't have to do it like on any yeah. level. Like if someone's really toxic, even if it's like a good bit of money, we can, we have the flexibility to go like, this is not worth our health you know, peace out very nicely and then then do that. That's great, man. But now, I mean, you've been going for a while. The company is successful. You guys are killing it, doing all kinds of stuff. Like, I mean, I can geek out heavily with the Game of Thrones stuff that you've done. But you've done everything from, you know, ads for like Nike and Ford to documentaries and, and network promos and trailers. Is there a big difference between those? Do they all feel very similar or are they all extremely different from each other with how you approach them and go about constructing the sound for them? Yeah, there's definitely technical approaches and kind of stylistic approaches that are different. A lot of it, I would say that the biggest thing that matters is who we're working for directly how their attitude is because there are things that could be you know pretty low profile that could just be stressful like crazy but just insanity amounts of stress just doesn't give you like the best creative work or like reactive notes this is something we don't get very often now oh yeah but um you know it it would be great uh i totally know what you mean by reactive notes could you explain that a little further for anyone listening yeah it's like a fear it's like a fight or flight response that'll happen when a client might give you notes they I i think it's easy to forget that our clients have clients and bosses too. And so there's a certain amount of trust 
and putting their neck out on the line they have to do to hire you to do something. And so what might happen is you do your best job, you present something, but then a fight or flight, and this happens to me too, even with my own team occasionally, I have to fight it. It's just a natural response. Yeah. So you might submit something and it's not like exactly what's in their head. And before they have time to process it and realize, oh, there's some changes here. There's some big picture things we haven't communicated. It can easily, you know, just human nature say, oh my goodness, this is it. This was a mistake. And then just kind of be very like pointed with notes in kind of a negative way where it's just like you can say, you know, bring the dog bark down <laughs> and not be like, why would you choose that? You know, it's like you can say the yeah. same thing two different ways. But with creative work, like you need to have some flexibility to try some things and push some things and all that stuff. And it's just easy to take something out or change something or whatever. But like a lot of first passes, even on our side, these are like starting points, like thought starters, things like that. But it's really easy to be reactive. It's also easy. It's on the vendor side, too. Like all of us, you know, when we work work for people, we get very kind of like <laughs> sarcastic and smart alecky about like how they're treating us as well. It's <laughs> yeah. just based out of fear. You know, we want to just survive. The client. <laughs> yeah. The client doesn't know what they want. Well, they do. They really do. There's what do they big... know? <laughs> Suits around a table. What do they know? Yeah. There's like a giant machine of things. And, and really, I think that that's with what we're doing. Like, it's more about, I don't think that we ever go like, this is our vision. Unless someone says like, just try whatever you want and then we'll bounce back and forth, especially with trusted clients. But like everything is like kind of of, we're, we're, I guess we'll say, I'll say we're in a service industry. We're in service to what this brand, the client, you know, things need. Right. Sometimes it goes exactly the way we want, but sometimes sound doesn't need to be exactly like we perceive it for some sort of message to get across. Now I'll admit nowadays, we started this a year or two ago. We do sell sound design, like our service. Like if you come to DeFacto, like we got to sell you like, you know, sound design. So sometimes in minor cases, like we'll do kind of our own director's cuts of something and overhype sound in certain regards, because I know that that's what, you know, when people come to defacto sound.com, like they want to see hype sound design. However, in some cases, that's not what the message needs exactly, you know, for the actual client needs. So I don't know. I'm kind of veering uh, all over the place. Maybe you can uh, crack that whip and yeah, get me. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm just very interested in the like reactive sort of notes thing. Yeah. Cause I think that is a problem. Like you said, even when working with your team, that's something that I had to figure out and sort of rope in myself with figuring out like, you know, especially when it came to sound and music, I'm really particular with that stuff. And so I would get like a first pass of say the score and I would just react because it was not what I had in my head, yeah. which doesn't make it bad or wrong for the piece. It just wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So something that I just personally started doing, especially with any form of sound, is giving it a few days. Like I'll watch it yeah. and then I'll watch the whole thing without any sound or any music whatsoever to kind of do a cleanse and then I'll watch it again and then I'll give it a day and then I'll watch it again and then I'll give notes and and really let it set in and process it like you said and let it start to become a little bit more normal and glue into the piece because you it has to become familiar I found because this whole thing is so familiar to you mm -hmm. that when these additional things are then added into it it's foreign to this familiar thing and it can be a little jarring so giving it that time at least I've noticed really helps out a lot. And many times, you know, all the notes I would have given, like 90% of the notes went away because I realized, oh no, this actually is working really well. And yeah. more often than not, better than what I originally thought. Because, you know, you have this artist coming in with his or her perspective on what you've already discussed and what he knows you're trying to accomplish. And, you know, they just bring an extra level to it because it's their expertise. It's easy to get like demo love too. Oh, for sure. It's hard to compete with like Hans Zimmer when that's your like temp, <laughs> temp score there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because I do use temp and I, I like using temp. It really helps me pace things out because my pieces do tend to lean very musical. And then I, I just think it's a great way to be like, hey, here's the like emotion that I'm clearly trying to strike. Here's the pacing that I'm clearly trying to strike here. It's, you know, I, for me, I see it no different than when I show my cinematographer mood boards. I'm showing him yeah. frames from other films. I'm not saying do this exactly, but I'm like, you see how this makes you feel? That's what I'm going for. Yeah. And that's why I like to watch the film without any music or the sound design is to wash clean, you know, that temp love that definitely happens to everyone. And then once that happens, then it's like you're seeing it more clearly. You're getting the familiar out and the new can start becoming familiar. But yeah. so what I'm wondering about is like from a client aspect though, when a client comes to you in that way, how do you usually navigate that 
you know, are there times where you're like, no, no, this is working and you try to show them that? Or is it always just like, okay, we'll shift it? I'm going to kind of veer it in a different direction first. Hopefully this will kind of come back around. One thing that I think a lot of people complain about is like things being like non-original and like everything's a remix and kind of every advertising spot you see is the same. And we're all trying to like change and jolt that and every branded piece of documentary or documentary, like it's all kind of the same machine. And it really is because right. we're approaching all of the elements that make that thing in the exact same order that everyone has told us to do since the beginning of, you know, Hollywood. And right now we're living in an age where like you can turn all of that stuff completely on its head. Like you don't have to have post audio at the very end after every single decision has been made. Now post audio or sound design person, you just, you know, kind of do your little thing and, and move forward. All of that to say is like a lot of these like really creative things that have been considered technical in the, in the past coloring or, or sound or, you know, these things can be brought in just like way earlier to start influencing things. One story that I'll mention in particular where sound itself kind of like changed an entire tone is um, we mixed this amazing documentary, just incredible. It's called Blood Brother. It won Sundance in both categories. Oh, wow. So it was huge there. But one of the reasons I felt like it worked, I mean, skipping all the fact that like, you know, the producer was incredible, the contacts, the story was incredible, all that stuff. But as far as, far as what happened on the sound side, that really worked is that when the director, Steve Hoover, came in to mix, like we had spent a couple months working on it and crafting it, doing our best version of it. One thing that he did was show restraint and things. And like when something terrible would happen on screen, we would like reinforce it with sound. And he had the wherewithal to go, no, what is happening on screen is powerful enough. We don't have to punctuate it with like a cliche Hollywood sound effect. So not only that, but like there were also, it was pretty stacked music top to bottom. And this was a roughly 90 minute film. And when you, the nature of making that film, you're making it in little scenes and then eventually you're kind of putting the scenes together and now you're kind of like crafting it all. And again, we're doing everything in, in perfect order, but in the final day of mixing, there were a couple times where he wanted to hear a scene without music at all. And we would do that. We'd play it, no music. And then it would be like, oh, that's, you know, I would assume all he's trying to do is just hear it without music to make sure that he can kind of wrap his brain around, you know, the environments and sound and all that stuff. But, you know, we'd finish a scene and he'd go, okay, great, let's move on. And I was like, okay, well, let me click the music back on, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, 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 let's just leave the music out. And I'm like, you don't change music the last day of a mix. Yeah. But he had the, like, foresight to understand that, like, one, certain things don't need music to tell you that they're emotional. Like, Definitely. There's a million horrible things to say. But in this one, there were, you know, the horrible part is that there were children dying. And music doesn't need to tell you that that's terrible. Like everyone can relate to that. Yeah. And so showing restraint and even removing music altogether gives a sense of like the audience is bringing their own experience to it and grasping at what they're trying to make meaning out of based off of their own background. And I think that's important too, is like, keep in mind, like every note you add to something is putting your worldview in front of someone, not saying that music is, is bad. It's not music is great, but it is a thing that like kind of starts to box people into this is exactly how I want you to feel and be shaped. But there are times where you can simply take music away and not give anyone a foothold on what to grasp. And it can be just as effective. I mean, I'm sure not everyone watches Game of Thrones. We don't, we don't mix the show. We mix trailers and stuff for them. But for example, uh, in a very vague way, I'll mention whenever you have you know, a horde of these people going into the darkness and there's no music and there's no light, like how freaking eerie is it that yeah. you don't have anything as an audience to say like, what is going to happen? What's, you know, turn up the brightness, like turn up the score. Like I need to know exactly what's happening. Like it's eerie unto itself. Yeah. It's a very interesting way to kind of put you in the place of the other characters that are in the moment. And when you see a lot of like dramas and like really incredible movies, there's actually a lot more natural sound carrying it than if you kind of analyzed it. And I think that it's a product of the order at which we do everything. Like we write, we don't think much about sound. I mean, some writers do, a lot of writers do, but like you kind of, you write, you go into pre-production, you go into production, you do, you go into editing, you do this, that, da, 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 you do the score, you go into sound and it's just that order all the time. But at least we're seeing a huge trend, at least in our world of like, even on trailers, advertising, promos, documentaries, all these things, like we're now being involved in the initial cuts and we're going back and forth with the director before any client sees anything. Oh, that's great. And it's bringing a freshness and, and reviving things that, and an originality that the industry doesn't see at all because we're so stuck in like, this is the way we do everything. But all of that is on its head right now. You can really do anything you want. Uh, even right now, like podcasts, you're seeing a huge jump in audio drama podcasts. And it's not because people just want to do audio drama. It's because people are selling stories to studios through audio only because it's significantly cheaper to do 
in audio. So there's just like all kinds of crazy ways. Uh, I hope I don't think I answered your question at all, but that was my little sidebar. I liked your sidebar better than <laughs> what we were talking about. <laughs> well, I anyway. appreciate it. So it worked out great. Yeah, I love that. Do you do you see a world where sound is brought in very early on something like a feature? Oh, yeah. And it is. That's the thing that I think is something that people don't realize that even in, you know, Hollywood studios, like these sound is is brought in early. They have a, what do they call these? Maybe they call them temp dubs, where the picture editor will have kind of like a weekly version of something. And then this might not be like on the main stage at Skywalker Sound, but like a sound designer and mixers, like they're kind of working in tandem. So sound is a much bigger process and a much more involved in film and television than you'd imagine. I think we have an assumption that that due to like all kind of our smaller and corporate size projects that like it's still in this order where like in on Star Wars, like they're, you know, finishing the cut, then sending it to sound. And, and we all know if we just think about that, that's not true at all. They're involved like throughout the picture edit. And that's how how we get such like mesmerizing sound and that's how we can get enormous scenes with no music that still has the same amount of emotion because sound is is right there the whole time and what i want to do at least with my company is on all of the short form side as far as like advertising promos trailers branded documentaries documentaries all that stuff on all the short form side i want i take that approach on like that same film approach where we're way ahead of the process like don't show temp sound to clients they don't know they have no like real understanding of what it's gonna sound like it's incredibly hard to like especially for someone who doesn't think about it all all the time to like kind of visualize and like conceptualize what a soundtrack will sound like unless you just kind of give it so yeah that's kind of what i hope to specialize in and in my world that's great so while following the process on something like a feature is that then sort of an original temp track then that that's going along with what you know clearly the film's going to do but it's kind of a a rough draft of what eventually will be replaced with the final? Sort of. And I'm speaking much more toward the sound effects track because something that we don't do here at DeFacto is the music. But on the... um, No, I would say that, I mean... I have a lot of friends doing that stuff and I don't think that it's necessarily temp. It's just a working in tandem. And, uh, And it's also great because... With the traditional way of doing anything, if you're trying to squeeze everything into the last second, you're basically operating under a like white knuckle stress environment where you're not going to get the best creative. However, if you start bringing that sound back, like in film or even advertising or whatever, you start bringing that sound back where we're going to give something to the client, we're going to like have something initial in there. Even you as a creator and a sound designer, you can step away because they have it for a week and then reapproach it and go, oh, okay, now I'm hearing it. That's not working. Let me try something here. So like, yeah, uh, even with my team, like I am not a fan at all of like the, I can do it faster boasting in this world. None of us on, on our team is about like, how fast can we get it done? Now I do expect every single person on my team to be like incredibly efficient with the way that they work. So like they know all their hotkeys, they are very fast, but Pro Tools and their equipment is just a paintbrush. They don't think about it. They just operate. And all they're thinking about is the creative as it's going. Yeah. So in theory, you know, we are very, very fast. But I think that like there's a speed of of which of just getting past your tools. So all of that to say is like creatives need time to make things great. No one, even like the best sound designers can't just like whip something up and shoot it out. And it's like perfect. Even though a lot of what we do is like same day stuff. So there is a bit of that, but that kind of gets with knowing clients and their preferences and things like that. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I think, I think across the board when it comes to our field and just every Avenue time is the most valuable asset. The way that we look at it is like, You want to be incredibly fast with your tools. Like if you're an editor and you're on Premiere or Avid or whatever, like you want your tools to just be this thing that just gets you to the creative faster. Yeah, just an extension of your fingers. Exactly. So you want to get, like for us, if we're doing like a trailer or something, we want to get that trailer, all the stuff we know how to do, and get that thing mixed like in with its current elements. We want that done as fast as humanly possible. Things that we don't have to think about to where then we have all this time to like really manipulate and mess with things and see what actually works and kind of experiment and all that stuff. So like getting to a place where it's like good and okay and kind of like as the editor intended, but a better mix of it is like step one. Then it's like, now we start to mess around. We start to open up different programs. We mess, you know, try new things. We manipulate sounds and all that stuff. So what, what is the sort of first thing that you're doing when you, when you get a project and you open it up? Like what is the first thing that you're doing to start your, just get your way into this specific, say if it's a trailer. It's all organization at first because 
you know, as, as much as we do come in earlier and earlier and earlier, there's always a starting point where we just have no idea what's happening. So I might, you know, we might get a list of 30 notes for like a, a minute long trailer or something. And it's just like, I have no idea what we're doing right now. So the first thing is like getting familiar, high level, looking at it, watching it, making sure that like we understand like what the story is, not like where all the sound opportunities are. Because, you know, nothing is like more important than what's being said and what the intention of the emotion is. And so we have to be faithful to that first. So then we bring everything in. We just get like an, an OMF or an AAF, which is really easily exported from any video platform. And then what that does is we import that and that gives us in our uh, app, which is Pro Tools, gives us exactly what you see in the timeline with handles, with cuts, like every cut you put in there is in, in there. And then what we want to do is we just want to like get our brain organized on that. So we, we get the dialogue with the dialogue. We get the voiceover with the voiceover. We get all the sound effects with their mono or their stereo uh, you know, tracks. We get the music on there. We make sure the music is very clear and kind of checkerboarded where we're not crossfading manually between two things, but we have like independent control. Control. So it's a lot of like getting things hyper organized because to jump way ahead, another thing about sound is that the stereo mix or the 5.1 mix that we provide is only one piece of a giant sound puzzle. For example, we also have to deliver, it could be in stereo, mono, or 5.1 splits, just depending on the circumstances. We have to deliver like a voiceover track mixed and clean dialogue track mix and clean, sound effects mixed and clean. Sometimes those sound effects get broken down to just backgrounds, just hard effects, just uh, foley, just emotional effects too. So there could be kind of like breakout points from that. And then there's just music by itself without automation and dipping on it. And so the reason we have to get super organized is because at the end of the process, whether it's going to a film distributor or whether it's going to a network or whether it's even going to an advertising agency, they need maximum flexibility because, again, we're only a small piece. This could play in Germany, and they need to put a German-speaking person in there. They need to add in actors or things, and that happens all the time. Like, we're just on the front end of a giant process, and audio is where a lot of those things can happen. I encourage filmmakers and people to think more about that. Like, if you make a little mini documentary that's really fascinating— and how much time and effort you've spent on crafting that, how easy it would be to maybe hire another actor and do it in German or French or something and open up an entirely new market. Because we are ultra saturated here in the US, so it's harder and harder to get people's eyes and minds on your project. But you start to open this up into markets through sound where they have much less content. And it's cool. I've even thought about doing that with my own podcast and stuff is just kind of like localizing and sound is where like localization magic really happens. And yeah, that's great. So after you do all your organization, what would be your next step there? Would you like attack dialogue first? Like, yeah. do you have an order of things? Yeah. So the first thing is usually going to be dialogue or music, because what we really want to get is that like marriage between dialogue and music right off the bat before we even start jumping into sound effects. And so um, usually the first thing is like we're going to get all of the uh, edits clean because another limitation that video editors have is that you only have 24 or 30 or 60 increments within a second to cut with. Yeah. Whereas we have anywhere from 41 to 48,000 to 96,000 increments on that. So you might think that like even 30 or 60 is enough, but I, it's very easy once you get granular down to a second, how clunky that is in a lot of ways. So like infinite cut ability on that. So we're getting all of those edits much more clean. Sometimes we have to like kind of extend some tone, even though personally I'm not a tone room tone fan at all. American style of mixing doesn't really like want lots of noise and tone. That's kind of a different thing. Like the British love very natural sounds. You put a microphone from five feet away and they want to hear like the room and they want to hear everything. That's very interesting. So you don't use room tone at all? What we try to do, my preferred style, I think that we are extraordinarily American in the way that we operate in the way that we mix. And the American way is really almost a complete and utter removal of anything that could be perceived as noise. I don't like noise at all because when you can get rid of noise completely, like if you imagine noise is just like white noise, white band, whatever. Like I sleep with yeah. a noise machine at night because I don't want to hear <laughs> the, same. the creaks and cracks of the, you know, the house or whatever. But the same thing can happen in film, TV, and all these other things, too. If you add noise, you can't get this ultra clarity and very minute things. Like, if you go back and watch, like, Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, like, oh, my goodness, it's so quiet. Like, when there is no dialogue, it is, like, next to nothing with sound. And even naturally on the set, there's going to be more sound than that. So it's a very, like, 
intimate, close up perspective. Not everyone agrees with that. Not even, you know, different countries. They, they like to have the microphone maybe a little bit further away, hear the room, things like that. Not me. I want it to be incredibly intimate and every nuance of the dialogue to be just like crystal clear with nothing else affected because everything else I can add later. So yeah, dialogue, we're essentially not doing noise. We want to take that noise, analyze it, and then do a reverse removal of that. So is that one of the first things you're doing with the dialogue then? You're just removing yeah. all the noise? Yeah, we're trying to get rid of noise and, and making it ultra clear. Even some things have kind of like reverby room sounds, and we're trying to get rid of those reflections. Because I just want a clean, ultra clean dialogue track from top to bottom where you never notice a cut. You know, everything's super clean. You have just this raw, beautiful track where it's just, uh, you know, fertile ground to do whatever you want. If I want to add wind, I don't want that to come from my dialogue track. I want that to come from the oh, cleanest, yeah. best sounding recording in the entire world, which we have, which we use a lot. Even with wind, like a kind of an, a non-experienced sound designer might just put in a but that gives you no character. Like what I'm looking for is like a like character in your wind. And like, Oh yeah. We want as juicy and as like as much story or whatever that could be kind of, even in something like wind, wind can also be dissonant where we don't want it to be dissonant. Wind can be harmonic where we want it to be or where we don't want to be. So even like environments, we can use those in a way to do very subtle nods to whether something needs to be kind of eerie or something that needs to be kind of like harmonic. You see this in games all the time. Games are like light years ahead of most, I wouldn't say television and film because they're, they're in the, the ballpark there, but games uh, are light years ahead of like advertising with that use of tone and things like that. So yeah, so we, we get an ultra clean dialogue track. Sometimes we'll mix that just to kind of get it in the ballpark because really everything anchors on dialogue. We always want, you know, in a calibrated room and all those things, we, we always want that dialogue to be heard in exactly the way that's intended. So we might have some variation. Of course, we're gonna have some variation on volume and things like that. But when you just play it from top to bottom, we're a glorified remote control. You don't turn up, you don't turn down. We do that job for you. Yeah. So then we have like a really clean dialogue track. Usually the next thing what I'll do is go to the music, make sure all those music edits are really clean. The transitions are really clean. Sometimes, depending on what we're working on, We'll get splits from the actual composer too. And that's really helpful because if you have something that's hogging the same frequency range as the voice, it becomes extraordinarily difficult to mix to. And just for anybody who doesn't know, could you explain splits? Oh, splits. Yes. So splits would be a composer might send us low frequency things. So maybe like basses and low synths. They'll send us a separate track of kind of like mids, maybe cellos and violas or, you know, anything that's kind of in that mid range. And then they might send us a completely separate track of like flutes, piccolos, you know, electro instruments that are kind of in that high range. And then they could, you know, that could, that could be further expanded too. Like if we have a violin solo, like that's going to be its own independent thing. But when you put all of these splits together, you essentially get the stereo mix of exactly what the composer was intending. Yeah. Now that's what the composer is intending when it's full volume and it's the primary thing that we're supposed to be listening to because there's a huge difference between listening to music in a film or television show versus something that commands your entire attention. And I think we know that. Right. And that's why like people study to soundtrack music because it is not designed to command all of your attention. It's designed to be a supporting act to something else that's going on. And it's a completely different yeah, absolutely. style. Do you ever get all of the stems from the composer or is it always those splits of just the different frequency instruments? I prefer to kind of have my hands tied a little bit, really with the lows, mids, highs, and then maybe solo instruments. There are times, depending on how sound designy something is. For example, I've worked with this uh, fantastic composer, Ryan Talbert, who's also a very good sound designer unto his own right there. But he'll, he'll oftentimes add a, a lot of real ethereal sound design things to his soundtrack just to give like color but he also knows that like he wants to give that in the hands of whoever's mixing because they might try something what i love about his particular style is like he stretches so far into sound design and we as sound designers try to stretch really far into music so we have this big gray area of things we can play with between two different soundtracks that's a lot of fun and so that's where we might go further with splits if that's the case Lots of other composers that we work directly with will usually provide that just to not kind of clash. When in doubt, a composer will usually kind of split something off to where we're not getting our hands tied. And, and the composers generally know where that is. If you're going to put a big violin solo right in the thick of like key dialogue, it's going to be miserable and we're going to have to pull just that violin down. But if we don't have the splits, what will happen is we have to mix to those frequencies. And in that case, you lose 
low frequency content, which is not at all in the way of dialogue, like low frequency content, you can push some bass and still hear people crystal clear because people just don't have those frequencies in their voice. But ultimately we want to mix things to where it's still full and clean. And then we pull things out like violins that could be kind of in the way. And then we can boost that where there's not dialogue and things like that. But yeah, so splits with that is helpful. There are ways that we manipulate that when we don't have splits. We can kind of automate EQs. For example, what we do a lot of is when we pull something that's real warm and bassy and we pull it under dialogue, a lot of times we're pushing the bass because we don't want to lose the warmth and the low end off of that. And that's not really something the composer can provide. Like that's really like a overall like mixer thing to really think about. And that's the other thing is just like a lot of composers, they've worked with certain mixers and they're like, oh my goodness, I love working with them because, you know, the music is not abrasive, but it's still full and present. And it's a, it's just like a multi-dimensional approach to like how someone treats music that the composer can't provide themselves. So yeah, so usually then we're just kind of getting that gelled with the dialogue to make sure that like we have some sort of anchor when we just play it, it plays at a great volume. Then I like to go into sound effects, which then I don't have to mess around with a ton of different leveling because I already have like a rough mix of the film or the spot or the trailer or whatever already. Traditionally, I've started kind of ground up where we do backgrounds and then kind of stack up to hard effects and things. And I'll explain what all that stuff is too. But now I've kind of flipped that after some talking to different sound designers and things. And now we kind of like focus on the most important sound design aspects and then move our way down. Because sometimes we can get really key with sounds. And then by the time we get to back, Backgrounds, it's like we just don't need backgrounds here at all because it's so crystal clear, like a car spot and we're just like cars revving and flying by and going nuts and all that stuff. Like the air in the background is not going to do anything but just clutter up that engine. So we kind of go top down now. So sound effects, I think of it in four different groups, which is not traditional. Some people kind of lump a few things together, but like I think of backgrounds. So that's like winds and rains and uh, environments and things that tie scenes together. Like, uh, you know, we're often shooting on one camera, flip flopping all over the place, but we want something to trick the viewer into thinking this was all, you know, this is real. This is reality here. So backgrounds kind of tie things together. We don't really cut, you know, forever flipping cameras or whatnot. So backgrounds, then the next thing that I think a lot about is Foley. That's where we just perform all of the actions on screen. Because if you can imagine on set, the only thing that matters 100% is just the dialogue. I personally want the microphone as close to their mouth, kind of out in front of them as humanly possible because everything else we can recreate. But when you get that, of course, their footsteps are off mic. It's just going to sound like off axis and it's just not going to sound clean. Preferably, we don't hear their footsteps at all because then later we want to go back add that character in because even the way that a foot falls or the way that someone picks up an element is part of the acting. So it's a really sensitive part where it is an extension of the actor. If you can imagine like, you know, if a sound person's not thinking about that, they can aggressively pick something up and change the attitude of a character. So that is like very much an extension of acting. You want to manipulate things. It's hard. You can't really like cut in pre-existing sounds and, and have them sell. They just sound canned. So Foley, extension of the acting, background. So then now we have kind of like a natural soundscape that feels really clean and tight. And also with Foley, we're we're recording it from two to four inches away from the source. So it's just, again, ultra clear, no noise. We can mix it with infinite possibilities because of that. The next thing I think about are like hard effects. That's like a door slam, a car by, like anything that like you can cut from a library. And even with that, like having great libraries is like the difference between something that sounds like okay and incredible. A place where we spend the most money is like on all these crazy independent sound libraries of of people that we know and people that we respect and and all that stuff. So then, uh, you know, an explosion, a gunshot, a car by a door slam, you know, uh, most things can usually be cut in and be crafted from a handful of other sounds. Yeah. And again, usually they're not like just stock pulls and drop them in there. It's like, we're kind of messing with them and making them work and adding things and subtracting elements. So a hard effect are effects that are pre-existing that you're bringing into the project? Generally. Yeah. So like hard effects okay. generally are like things that you can, have that you've already pre-recorded or things that are kind of in your library that you can just drop right into the session gotcha. and craft and manipulate. So usually it's going to be something like, you know, you can't record a car by every time there's a car that goes by. You can't go and slam a door every single time that happens, but you can have 800 door sounds <laughs> that have like every characteristic imaginable. So like, you know, residential, hollow, door with you know air or verb or something like that and you can find some of those things but in cases like that we might we'll still add 
like low end punch or mid range punch or different things, just if it needs like additional attitude or, or something. So there's still a lot that goes on with that. It's definitely not as simple as like, I found this door sound here it goes because there's so much like human creativity that goes into that as well. So those are three before we get to the four. So we've got backgrounds, Foley, hard effects. But then what the other thing that we talk a lot about that I've really only heard like our group separate this into its own category is emotional effects. These are things that are not tied to a direct action on the screen from like a character, but they're more used like musical elements to like evoke emotion. The most extreme version of like emotional effects are like trailer sounds like bouges and bois and like hits and reverse risers and cymbal scrapes and like cymbal or, or metallic like rolls or things that like you're trying to get like your your spine tingling and things like that and we do that a lot in advertising but it's, it's again it's kind of stretching into the musical thing but it's a little bit more tied to screen because something happened on screen that maybe the composer didn't do because it just didn't make sense to put that in music so those are like the four elements. And then really just like, you know, we, we did our dialogue, we did our music, we did our did kind of like a preliminary mix. And then now it's just like crafting and creating sounds and making sure that they speak and that they're clear. And I just really love like ultra clean soundtracks because the cleaner they are, like the more detailed and juicy and uh, the more character a sound can give to something when you just don't have noise and you don't have like any dirt in it. So yeah, that's generally like kind of the path. And then after that is what we, you know, we kind of do our thing. A lot of times things will come with preliminary notes. I try to address a lot of those things. And then eventually we'll post it up to Frame.io and send it on over. And uh, that's our first react off of this. And, and hopefully, you know, someone does the same thing as you and where they listen to it. Sometimes they're like, oh my goodness, this is perfect. Move on. And sometimes they're like, okay, well, let me think about this for a little while and like really nitpick every half second. And I love that because, you know, the more people are thinking that are thinking about sound, the better. And it's exciting to work with people who are like now pushing their brain into like creative sound design. And so that's big. Every client that we work with and every collaborator, I want really thinking about sound just to the same level as we are. Yeah, I mean, that, it's so much. And I and just the progression of things makes so much sense. And that just how it all interweaves in the end just makes so much sense. Do you, so do you think that just that clear progression, even on an indie level of someone just at home mixing their own, say, short film by themselves, do you think going about that, you know, more professional world progression of things, do you think that's going to help perfect their own sound just in doing it by themselves at home and whatever software they have? Yeah, totally. Because you need some sort of organization and some sort of focus to move forward. There's nothing worse than kind of just like starting at the beginning and sound at least starting at the beginning and like crafting everything inch by inch along the way. There's certain things that come with that. Like organization is just going to get your brain to where you look at something and you know where everything is. So like getting it in the right spot is just going to like organize your brain. The second thing is like doing passes on dialogue or volume or cleaning things up will then help later with not having to like remix every single sound effect that you do later. Like if you get your mix in the pocket before you even start sound design, you don't have to then go back if your mix is off and then like remix 8,000 sound effects that you put in there. So it's like you kind of want to build off of things that make sense. And I would say that like a good 75% of the time, no, that's that's probably incorrect. But like there's a good chunk of time where, where we're just getting everything organized in our brain. Like it's not so much like a creative thing. It's just like we need this done before this and this done before this and this cleaned before this and da 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 And then comes the like sound design and then like stretching the mix and all that stuff. But at first, I think organization is just incredibly important. I mean, even in visuals, like I don't know a lot about like the editing programs and stuff, but like you can imagine like just shots being everywhere and just hard to know. But like, if, but if you put like every time you sit down with this person, that's on the same video track or like every time you put do this, like then you can go and color it much easier because you just have it all on a track and you can do this or that or the other. So it's the same thing in sound. Like you kind of want things to be organized to where when you need to go back and go, oh, that one person is a little too dark or a little bright. You can just like grab it all on that track and make an adjustment rather than having to poke through and it take like, you know, 20 times longer to like find all those shots and then you miss one and all that stuff. So organization is just like a way to quickly make creative changes. So yes, I would say kind of on any front, anything that makes your life cleaner and more organized, once you get to the creative aspect, you'll get more out of it in the end. And to go back to one thing you mentioned, what, what do you mean by stretching the mix? Oh yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, so yeah, it depends on, like if we get it in the pocket, again, I'm kind of in a place where it's in, it's more organizational and it's in a proper volume because there are 
expectations across all media of how loud or quiet something can be. Some places like television, it's a super narrow window where every like the thing has to like average this very like specific number. And so sometimes that boxes us into where we have to be very tight and like with not much dynamic range. But then if we're doing something for like a theater or a large room, we have a lot more dynamic range that we can play with. And so at first when we're mixing things just to get it in the pocket, we kind of just do our gut check. Here's what we feel like it's going to be. But then there comes a time once you add sound effects that like sometimes music needs to come down. Sometimes music needs to come up to support that. Or there are times where like naturally the mix needs to punch and get louder here and naturally needs to be a little bit quieter over here, but within parameters. So by stretching the mix, it's that we don't like kind of get the mix in the pocket early on and then just never deviate from it. It then becomes later a creative process unto itself. Like after we've creatively built out sounds and kind of crafted all this stuff, like, I mean, personally, my favorite part of a process is the final mix, because then you can kind of like give things more punch and dynamic range here or there or remove things. Or if like something isn't speaking in the sound design, you're like, ah, I love that sound. But like all it's doing is cluttering it up. Like in the mix, you remove that for clarity's sake. And so by stretching the mix, it's like really like that step where the mix itself is like a creative organism. And it's kind of different than like a preliminary like level mix. And what about for the independent filmmaker who is doing everything themselves from pre to post production? Have you seen a lot of these films where there's like the usual mistakes that you're seeing over and over again from these like younger or newer filmmakers that just drive you crazy that might be an easy fix or something they're just not thinking about? Well, I'll start by saying that I despise the old audiophile kind of world of sound. Meaning like you're kind of like this angry, disgruntled person that like no one's allowed to question, you know, what you're doing. And you're like the sound expert and like you need to approach like the the sound God with like permission to do things, you know, as an independent filmmaker. <laughs> right. The reality is, is like I want to crush that with with all of my being because the best projects that we've ever done, like most of the stuff on our site, there was an incredible director, editor, or writer that built those opportunities along the way. It wasn't just like here de facto do your magic, which are not good words to say to a sound company because it is not magic. It is something that's like well thought out and crafted ahead of time. So all that to say is like, no, you do not need permission to make things sound great. Like if something sounds cool to you or a sound effect or whatever, or like you want to mess around with something like do it because no one can tell you otherwise. Uh, sound is something that, you know, most people know when something sounds good or sounds bad. And uh, kind of to start out with sound design, it's just like, I love it when people throw stuff at the wall. And there's times where we can't compete with what even an editor's done or, or a director to begin with. But it also, when you present, especially like in our case, when we're presented, presented with something that's really like well-crafted sound design already, it's like a direct challenge, like make this better. And, and then it just, you know, we, we craft harder. We, we, you know, try to squeeze every little inch out of like every little nuance and, and frequency and all that stuff. So I'd say that as far as mistakes that people are making a lot of, I will say that it's extraordinarily difficult to make dialogue sound polished in some of the editing systems. And it's not due to any sort of lack of talent. It's just due to the way that like tracks are managed and like things are processed and like things are like stuck. Whereas in the post audio side, you can do things in real time in ways that like we don't want to stick like permanently. I guess the way that you'd say that is like render them in, you know, or like kind of flatten them. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Destructive editing. But I do think like a baseline level of like EQ and compression is helpful. It's a very nuanced thing. So like usually when I, I can tell if someone mixed this kind of internally in the box or like in an editing system or not. But if someone's kind of like naturally a lot of microphones are very boomy and bassy. And so the key frequencies here to think about are like with dialogue, you really want to like roll off pretty aggressively everything below like 80 hertz and sometimes 100 hertz. And like if it's like someone with a very light voice, very female voice, maybe even a little bit higher than that. If you have a big boomy narrator, you might keep that 80 hertz or whatnot. But below that, you just have rumble and rumble is bad for like specs and uh Low frequency content just has a lot of energy and power and it can really mess with like a lot of things. So like if there's a rumble of an air conditioner in the background, like you, there's no need for that in your dialogue track. So you just cut that stuff off. Another frequency range that we think a lot about is like 250 hertz is very like your boxy mid range part of the voice. So we will typically dip that down a little bit and do a really wide bandwidth or cue or whatever it says in there. So like 
we want it to be really gentle. Generally, if you're doing like very sharp EQs with very tight bandwidth and stuff, like that's not like EQing for like overall. That's much more like, um, oh, what would you call that? Like sound restoration or like sound like you're fixing problems that shouldn't have been there to begin with. Like a Sennheiser 416 microphone is not designed for you to have to do 100 EQ changes. Like it's just microphones are not designed that way. And we're living in a time where these are the best microphones in all of human history. So if you're doing weird, crazy stuff, like something went wrong on set to begin with. Yeah. So 250 Hertz really wide. We're kind of dipping that a little bit for clarity and you can get much more air and it sounds more natural. Again, going back to what I was saying about like the microphone being very intimate and very tight. And all I want is that clean dialogue. Well, the flip side of that is you do get a very boomy, bassy, intimate thing. So what we're trying to do is just make it a little bit more natural, dip a little bit of that 250, very wide thing, cut off all those ultra low frequencies. How much do you usually see yourself dipping that 250? All the time, like almost on everything in some regard, because it's just real uh, mid rangey. So, uh, but uh, microphones do love low end hype. Uh, even the microphone that I'm on right now, I'm going to have to like EQ a lot of this low end hype down because it's so intense. And then on the flip side is 4,000 hertz. Again, this is kind of generic, kind of the same thing. Very wide bandwidth, like trying to just capture as many frequencies around that as possible. Ultra gentle. We do a little boost on that too. So that happens almost all the time is like most microphones are super dark. And so we do a little brightening of it because again, by itself, it might sound like, oh, that's a little brighter than what I, you know, would like to hear. I want it to be super warm and bassy. But the problem is between music and sound effects, you get a ton of mid range and low end content and dialogue needs to like be crisp and, and sit on top of that stuff. So by itself, it might sound like, okay, that's like 10% brighter than I want. But like in the context of a mix, it just sounds so crisp and clean and like it projects without you having to work hard for it. On top of that, like compression is really important. Now, it depends on if you're doing a film or a like TV or a advertising. Compression uh, really just makes the level like really consistent to where if you had something on a low volume on a TV, you don't have to turn it up to hear the ends of people's words. Because we naturally, when we talk, we kind of trail out the ends of our sentences. It's just something we all do. So something we do yeah. a lot is push the ends of the sentences into a compressor. Usually what we do is three to one ultra fast attack as fast as possible. And we usually attenuate, which means uh, how much it's it's actually affecting somewhere between like three and six decibels. So not a ton, but that's if you can master that EQ and compression, like that's going to get you so far down the road because they're so nuanced. And and the problem is, is if you go into Premiere and you go into the audio section, there's a million plugins. You don't even know where to start. Like you don't even know like well, I, don't, I don't even know like what any of this. Do I need reverb? Do I need to start doing the noise reduction? This, that, and the other. It's like now you kind of just need to know EQ and compression. Like everything else is like an additional flavor on top of that. But those are the basics. So yeah, I think that that's really important. A little compression uh, to speak back onto the film side of it, the world's best compressor. And I'm not talking about data compression. I'm talking more about like keeping sound being consistent and somewhat in volume. The best compressor in the entire universe is the air around us. So if you just talk and you go 20 feet away from me, like my voice will start to get super quiet because the air resistance is starting to just push those frequencies down. But you might hear a rumble from a truck from a mile away. And that's just because those frequencies carry better. So all that to say is if you're in a theater or in a giant environment, we compress less because we want the actual room itself and the air and the 40 feet between a speaker and a listener. All that air is going to put this gentle, beautiful compressor right on top of it. And so that's the big difference between mixing like a trailer, which is like going to be on YouTube, on broadcast, on small speakers, in your face, maybe a home theater that's that's 10 feet away from you to something that's 30, 40, 50, 60 feet away. And that's why you see movies being mixed in these giant rooms. It's not because they need to be flashy. It's because they need the air itself to mimic what the air would be in an actual theater. So that's like the biggest difference between big rooms, small rooms. And those, those even the big room stuff, that'll still translate in smaller rooms. But that's where it's like if you're at midnight watching Lord of the Rings or, or Game of Thrones or something, you're like constantly turning up and turning down because like it's it doesn't have that air to kind of like compress things down and, and not bother your neighbors with. Yeah. So yeah. Man, that, that makes a lot of sense. This is some great tips about the dialogue and some that I'm definitely going to start using as well because, you know, the quick turnaround stuff that we do all the time, just having those little tips to kind of make things stand out a little bit more and feel a little bit more polished are really invaluable. And really, it's like basics. It's like EQ compression. There's nothing that's going to like, you're not going to be like a voodoo plugin that comes out that just takes care of you. As anyone working in any sort of visual video world, I think a very baseline EQ understanding, again, 
EQ is not about making smiley faces with your equalizer and your like 1986, you know, Mazda protege. It's about very gentle things to kind of like get clarity and frequency manipulation. And I will say that like generally when I hear something that has not been mixed, it's usually very mid rangey and bassy. And so what you want to do, you keep adding and adding and adding and all this stuff. And you just get this very like wompy, like whoa, 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 whoa sound like out of a mix. And what you're trying to do is just put through all of these frequencies, just trying to get rid of that stuff. So you get a, a bit of clarity. And again, we have 20,000 hertz of vibrations that we can hear. And uh, the best things, even you hear this in pop music, you hear this all over the place, um, recorded music. If you've ever tried to record a band and mix it, like you immediately notice how mid-rangey and nasty it gets. Same goes for like TV, film, all that stuff. Is like you want to, mid-range is important. It's just very easy to overdo it. And then you put a bunch of stuff together and you kind of have to start carving from all of them to get more clarity. And we can push those frequencies up. We want to hear the, the 4Ks, the 5Ks. But then it gets dangerous. Then you have S's and things like that can, that can be very harsh and, and yeah. angry to the ear. So like then you got to be careful in that range. So let me let me throw the DSer in there too as maybe a uh, EQ, number one. Compression, number two. DSer, number three. Beyond that, noise reduction can kind of ruin you unless you really know what you're doing. So if you're going to do noise reduction, know what you're doing or practice it. But if you have those like four things kind of mastered and kind of, especially with the with the compressor, you need visual feedback on what, what's happening with the compressor. Uh, I think people can say like, well, just trust your ears, but it's just not that easy because some things are so subtle that you need a visual thing. So if you have a plugin, I personally in Premiere or any of that stuff, I pick the plugin with the most visual feedback because then you can actually see and hear the changes in effect. If it's so subtle that you can't see it, I don't know, it's hard. All of our plugins are like maximized for visual feedback and uh, and we can hear it when we get that in additional sense. What's your favorite compressor? Oh, well, they kind of just, you know, even like the Avid compressor is fine. We're using like, we've kind of gone ultra high end with some of our stuff. We use like Fab Filter for our EQ, which has, if you look that up, like both for EQ and compression, it's just like so much visual information that it's just, yeah. I mean, the first time I looked at it, I was like, oh man, this is nice. Like this is exactly what I've always wanted. Yeah. Those are the ones that I use too for that, that same reason. I, I love the visuals of it. Fab Filter. The other thing is like with noise reduction, I just love RX, like Isotope. I adore everything Isotope's making. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the real keys there. And I think for like even just brick wall compression, which is like a compression that means that like if you sit at a negative 10 nothing will go over negative 10 i think we just use the avid pro limiter for that then everything else is just kind of to taste that's awesome man yeah and it's crazy how much of it i, I always talk about this whenever i'm talking to friends in the sound world is how much the visual side of things like coincides with the sound side of things like the way to look at it is so similar even with like denoising on both side of things and the ideas of different frequencies and whatnot dynamic range all of it it's funny how it's like two sides of the exact same coin where it's like you can kind of talk about both things in the exact same way it's really interesting yeah. and that's really what like my mission is is just to get people to think about sound just as seriously because I think that I would say that like a big mistake I don't know if it's a mistake or whatnot everyone's selling a certain thing like if you want to be a cinematographer you want things that are just looking gorgeous but unfortunately a big chunk of projects are kind of for lack of a better term kind of like cinematography porn it doesn't really have much of a story but it's really beautiful yeah and to people in those worlds i would encourage you i know you love visuals and it's very visceral for you it's not as much for general audience and stuff I would question, are you making this to build your reel, which is valid? Are you making this for the general public? And do you really think that they're going to care with a lack of story? And then three, like try to just remove it all together. Like, can you tell the story with just the sound by itself, like straight from a script and remove the thing that is like so key? Because that can be added later. But again, I think that it's so cliche to say, but like story is everything. It's just right now I'm listening to one of the best sci-fi stories I've ever heard. And it's just an audio book. But my mind is the best art director in the world. You know, yeah. my experiences has built what I want to see in my mind. It's incredible. And that's an argument for sound in general. What book is it? It's called Dark Matter. Dark Matter or Dark Matters. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm halfway through it and I'm just I'm just so in love with it. It's like about parallel universes and crazy stuff. But yeah, so uh, so what, I, you know, you don't need permission, but also take sound seriously because we have five core human senses. There's an argument there's, there's way more than that. But the five that we think about the most uh, are the things that make us so uniquely human. 
And we have only two of those that we can use to tell these visual stories. Unless you're at Disney World where they have like smell elators and whatever they call those things. <laughs> but in our case, like, you know, we're very visual creatures. That's natural. Every You can't help but look around in any direction and see, see that everything is visually designed by a human for the most part, unless you get out into nature. And even then, a lot is crafted by a human for different things. We've got our taste, you know, three times a day, plus, minus. We're, we're very concerned about the things that we taste. We take that very seriously. We have our touch, like the seats that we're sitting in, the desks, the seat in our car, like HVAC being at a comfortable temperature. Like if something's off with touch, we're going to be all over it. And then you've got a smell, which, you know, sewage and candles. And like, if something doesn't smell good, you smell skunk. It's very annoying. But with sound, like generally, generally sound is this thing that's just like, "Ah, I don't think about that. I don't think it's that we're necessarily not sound oriented as a species. I think that culturally we have put sound in this place that doesn't matter. But if you go to Manhattan, it sounds horrible and it's stressful and it gives you a feeling, the sound itself of chaos. And uh, that's not great for you, for your body. Quiet is great. Nature. There's a, one, of the, one of the main reasons that nature is so refreshing is because of those other senses, but sound itself too. And um, in this world of filmmaking, we only have two human core senses to play with. And yes, visuals are very important, but I think it just needs to be much more of an attitude of like, oh my goodness, I have a second core sense that I can maximize. And that doesn't come from the sound designer. That comes completely from the top down. And everyone that we work with is just so in love with sound. And it's great. And I, and I see people all the time just like achieving amazing sound things, even as they approach us. And that's a lot of fun. So I just say sound is you don't need permission for it. Just start messing with it. You'll change little minor things and go, oh my goodness, everything's different. This is incredible. And, uh, and it's fun. Yeah, man. I love that. And I, I couldn't agree more. Sound sounds really important to me. And I'm one of those people that write sound into the script. And I'm thinking about that very early on because I, I totally agree. I, I think sound will do more than VFX, than the cinematography. I think you could tell a majority of the story. And it solves a lot of problems. You can't pull off a yeah. certain effect. Sound will pull that off for you. And it's like it's very much like your audio book. If I, if I can make you hear it, I can make you see it. You just invent it yourself. So I, I just think that's so impactful. But I think that's a great place to uh, leave us off. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to have to do this again at some point. For sure. Can I plug one thing? Absolutely. Okay. My big pluggable. So whether or not you can work with the facto is, is difficult because I know that uh, it can be really expensive. I mean, sometimes it's not. It can be less expensive. So if you're in that ballpark, go check out defactosound.com. Most of how we make a living is by very quick, short, cheaper projects, not by the flash and gimmick that we put on the website. That flash and gimmick is good in its own right, but there is a thing where you go to the website and you see Game of Thrones on the front page, you're like, I don't want to send my like conference video to de facto it's just not going to be enough well that's how we <laughs> right, make a living right. so like corporate videos like is huge for us and 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 you know sure it's not this crazy thing but like we need things to like be bread and butter so like don't let what we work on detour people the second thing that you can do even if that's not something that you're interested in and i know that everybody says this go subscribe to my podcast so this podcast is a little unique it's not an inter- it's not an interview style it's not like a back and forth it's called 20,000 Hertz. It's all spelled out without any numbers and Hertz, which is H-E-R-T-Z. Started at two and a half years ago. Every other Monday it comes out. It's uh, basically documentaries about sound and ultra highly produced. It takes us about 150 to 200 hours per episode. That's crazy. There's writers. It's fully sound designed. Great scoring. Very well thought out. And it's very relatively short. So about 20 to 30 minutes usually. And it can tell you very broad stories about like, you know, as far as what the shows that would be interesting for filmmakers are things like um, sonic branding, like how companies approach sound kind of like how they do visuals or like the Wilhelm scream. We did like a whole series on like who was the scream, like when did it first appear, all that stuff. The THX deep note is just addictive. It's a two part series on just that one crazy sound that comes from like the THX logo. And it is like. It was going to be this short little story that turned into a giant two-part series because it's just so fascinating. Because I have a background in the filmmaking side, there's tons of filmmaking-esque ones, but then there's a lot of brain science and things that are kind of still sound-related but not in the filmmaking world, so just about psychology and brain science and, and all this stuff. So yeah, if you could do one thing, I would say right now, as soon as you finish with this, go over, search 20,000 Hertz, hit subscribe, and then just start listening to whatever you want. Yeah, man, for sure. It's it's one of the very few podcasts that I'm subscribed to. It's, it's it's great. Well, thank you. All right, man. Well, thank you very much. And we'll talk again soon. Cool. Thank you. 
And that's it. Thank you again to Dallas. And like I said at the beginning of the episode, jump over to filmriot.com forward slash podcast and you'll get all the info for Dallas, including links to his company, things that they've worked on, and to his amazing podcast that you should absolutely check out, 20,000 Hertz. It's really, really fantastic. It's a different sort of thing like he was talking about before. And I think you guys would really love it. Of course, you can find me online at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Conley. Until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Thank you.